Okay, thanks so much to everybody signing in, viewing the program live and streaming it. Congressman Israel, you can take some away. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, welcome everybody to the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University's book and author series uh, sponsored by Bernard Schwartz. Tonight, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power uh, written by Susan Page. We'll have a nice conversation with Susan Page. Uh, she'll be interviewed by Chris Reback and myself. Uh, and then we'll throw it open to your own questions uh, at about uh, 7.35. I want to welcome our friends at C-SPAN who are with us this uh, evening as we tape. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell, we have one very simple mission, uh, and that is to deepen discourse and raise understanding on complex issues uh, in a bipartisan way. Uh, before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, if I may. Uh, on May 12th at 7.00, uh, we're featuring a program on education and politics, setting the stage for the 2021 elections and 2022 elections, featuring Congresswoman Rosa DeLora uh, and Anna Greenberg. May 19th uh, at 7 p.m., Navigating International Hostage Situations, a collaboration with the Richardson Center, where Governor Bill Richardson will join us. So we hope that you will go to www.io pga uh, uh, cornell.edu or just Google Cornell Institute of Politics and you'll be able to register. Uh, joining us this evening, a few distinguished guests. We have former Congressman John Barrow from Georgia, former Congressman Martin Frost from Texas, the former chairman of the New York State Republican Committee, Ed Cox, Tompkins County legislator Martha Robertson, uh, Cornell is located in Tompkins County, the president of the AFL-CIO Richard Trumka, <laughs> Craig Kaiser, the chair of the executive committee of the Cornell Board of Trustees, Beth Anderson, a member of the Board of Trustees, Becky Robertson, a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, and now to our guests this evening. Uh, my co-moderator, as always, uh, is Chris Reback. He is the host of Chris Reback's Conversations and publishes Chris Reback's newsletter, which uh, I and many of my former colleagues in Congress view as absolutely essential in cutting through the clutter and understanding what's really going on in the world. You can sign up for that newsletter at chrisreback.com. Chris is also the co-founder of Good Guys Media Ventures and host of podcasts on politics, business technology, science, education, arts. His political wire conversations uh, has been ranked number three on iTunes news and politics category. And our very special guest uh, this evening, Susan Page, award-winning Washington Bureau's chief of USA Today, where she writes about politics in the White House, covered seven White House administrations, 11 presidential elections. She's interviewed the past 10 presidents. She re she's reported from six continents. I don't know where you went wrong on the seventh. I don't know what happened to that seventh continent. Dozens of foreign countries. And of course, in 2020, she moderated the vice presidential debate between Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. Now, Susan, before we get into the first question, I'm gonna take a, just a point of personal privilege and, and talk about this book. You know, I, as many people know, I chaired the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, uh, and whether it was me or any other chair of DCCC, that position is regarded as Nancy Pelosi's chief political lieutenant. And with that position uh, comes the responsibility of really getting to know her. Uh, and so on a typical day, I had one meeting with Nancy Pelosi, and a more typical day, three meetings with Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> four, five meetings, many, very often, the last voice I heard uh, at the end of a long day was not my wife's, but Nancy Pelosi's on the phone. And I thought I knew more about her than anybody else. And I, I'll be honest with you, when I was saying, uh, telling Susan this in the green room, when I first picked up the book, I was a little bit skeptical. I said, what, po what can I possibly learn from this book that I don't know having spent as much time as I did with her? I learned more about Nancy Pelosi from this book than I knew about her from my interactions, from serving her as, as the chair of DCCC for four years. Uh, and so I could not recommend this book. If you want to understand the dimensions of Nancy Pelosi, what drives her, her impulses, uh, her strategic view, her tactical view, her personal uh, commitments, the relationship she has with family, you must get this book. And uh, if we will post uh, the link to get it several times uh, during the next uh, hour or so. Susan Page, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Appreciate it. Congressman, it's such a, such a pleasure to be with you. I should note, first of all, that my husband is a proud graduate of Cornell. So very excited that I'm speaking at your institute. I know your institute is doing 
uh, great and valuable work for our democracy. I'm, I very much appreciate your words about my book. Uh, I don't want to out my sources, but I did have an excellent source whose initials were Steve Israel. So uh, to the degree I've understood Nancy Pelosi, some of that credit goes to you. So thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, in uh, in Washington, as you well know, most members of Congress read books from back to front. <laughs> you see if your name is there. And then if it is, you begin again. Um, Susan, you interviewed 150 people. You spoke with Nancy Pelosi 10 times, including some of the most complex and challenging days uh, that she had in leadership. Your research was so detailed uh, that you actually found uh, the House payroll <laughs> records when Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer uh, worked for Senator uh, Jerry Brewster in 1963 and disclosed that Pelosi was paid $106 a week and Steny Hoyer $49 a week. Arguably, you know more about Nancy Pelosi than anybody else anybody else, maybe even more than Nancy Pelosi knows about her. So here's my first question. With all of that information, what opinion did you have of Nancy Pelosi prior to the book that was most changed after your research process? I'm not sure that my view of her changed so much, but it, but it deepened. And I'll tell you one of the big surprises for me in researching this book. It wasn't the influence of her father, who was uh, and many people, I think, don't realize this. Her father was the legendary, larger-than-life mayor of Baltimore. She was really born into political royalty in Baltimore, the daughter of Tommy the Elder and Big Nancy D'Alessandro, mother, Big Nancy D'Alessandro, who was a woman way ahead of her time. Uh, Nancy Pelosi told me that if her mother was born today, she would be president of the United States. She was she was smart and ambitious and restless. Uh, she was a big risk taker. She, uh, she played the ponies. She had a regular spot at Pimlico. There were times when her husband, the mayor, would go to the to Sabatino's restaurant in Little Italy to pay off the bookies that his wife was in debt to. Um, she was the keeper of the favor file which was exactly what it sounds like, which was her husband's political operation, the keeper of the favors that he gave to constituents, uh, which were, would be repaid uh, on election day uh, with, with uh, support. She was, she was so partisan that this is, this sounds like a long story, I'll make it short. 1984, President White House calls, President Reagan's gonna come to Little Italy to unveil a statue of Christopher Columbus. Would the Dallas Saunders like to be the president's guest at this event? You'd think they'd say yes, right? Big Nancy D'Alessandro said, after all the things that Ronald Reagan has done to poor people in this country, don't let him come near us. The White House is so concerned, they call her son, who had, was himself a former mayor of Baltimore, to ask if his mother posed an actual physical threat to Ronald Reagan. And the son assured them that she was no physical threat, just a political one. That tells you something about the partisan roots of Nancy Pelosi. And I, uh, you trigger something from the book. You talk about how when Nancy and her husband, Paul, moved to San Francisco with their children in tow, they cannot find an apartment. <laughs> uh, I mean, they really were under tremendous pressure trying to figure out where they live. They finally find the perfect apartment until they find out that the landlord is going to Washington. Talk about that. <laughs> so at that point, they had four little children. Uh, nobody wanted to rent to them. They finally find the perfect house. It's got a swing set. It's in the right place. Uh, and they're about to sign the lease when she says, why is, uh, to the woman uh, of, of the household, why, why, are you, why is this house available to rent? And she said, oh, my husband has just gotten an appointment by Richard Nixon to uh, health and uh, to uh, HEW. And that's why we're moving to Washington. And Nancy Pelosi said, well, I can't rent a house that became available because Richard Nixon was elected and she wouldn't rent the house. They eventually bought a house that needed some work uh, because of her, that's how, that's how strong her politics are. In fact, when she was a little girl, her, her father took her to the polling places on election day as he often did. And a poll worker tried to give this little girl a stuffed elephant as a toy and she wouldn't take it because even then she knew what elephants stood for. Very revealing, Chris. 
thank you, Steve. And, and um, I noted that you mentioned, Steve, how some uh, folks will look at the back to see if they you know, name check themselves. Uh, I did notice that at least one of the names of uh, former representatives that are listening uh, is a is a gentleman who what is named and is name checked in Susan's book. Um, so that, that wasn't lost on me. I doubt it was lost on uh, Susan either. Um, Susan, I, I usually like to start these conversations um, at the beginning. And after all, you have written um, just a remarkable once upon a time, there was uh, an incredible young girl named Nancy D'Alessandro story. And it's a, it's a great tale. Um, but you've also written about power. And everyone who I talk to who wants to know about Nancy Pelosi remarks on um, her power, her use of power. And the, the, what we want to know is, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. What's the essence of her power? You've talked about her family, but also maybe could you talk about the different facets of it? And that struck me in the way that you described the ways she engaged with three different presidents, George W. Bush, um, Obama, and then Trump, and the way she employed different types of power with each of them. So talk to, talk to me please about Nancy Pelosi and power. One of the things, I kept changing the title of the book. Uh, it had a different title when I signed the contract. We went through another one, finally ended up with The Lessons of Power. Um, but every title I had had the word power in it. Because one of the distinguishing things about Nancy Pelosi is how comfortable she is with power. Uh, she has no qualms about power. This is a trait that is rare among male politicians. It's even rarer, I think among women who get into politics to be at so, so at ease with amassing power, with holding power and with wielding power. And a, a congressional long time friend of ours, John Bresnahan, a longtime congressional correspondent, he's now with Punchbowl News. About a decade ago, he wrote a profile of Pelosi for Politico that described her as an iron fist in a Gucci glove an iron fist in a Gucci glove. I think that is just about the perfect dis description of Nancy Pelosi's use of power because she does have a Gucci glove. She can be very persuasive. She is what's well, that soft power, but when she needs hard power, she has an iron fist like you wouldn't believe. And I felt this actually myself in the ninth, <laughs> in the ninth interview I did with her. I did 10 interviews in all for the book. In the ninth interview, I was asking her about something that she didn't want me to put in the book. And uh, uh, she said, you shouldn't put this in the book for this reason. And I said, well, actually, I think it should be in the book for this reason. And she started to uh, display the iron fist. <laughs> and it wasn't, you know, she didn't raise her voice and uh, uh, she didn't threaten me, but she did somehow get bigger. Like she started out five foot five uh, when we started talking about this. And by the end of this conversation, she was about six two. Uh, and she just, she asked such probing questions that forced me to articulate and defend the position I was taking, which she was trying to punch holes in. And we got to the end of the interview and she hadn't relented. She still thought I shouldn't put this in the book. I hadn't relented either. And I told her that, I thought it should be in the book and it is in the book, but I was so unnerved by the time I left the interview, which was about, which was about three o'clock in the afternoon that I, I drove home, I poured a glass of wine, I crawled into bed and I watched uh, Rizzoli and Isles reruns for a couple hours until I felt a little better. Now I can only imagine being a member of Congress and having an exchange of much greater import than this one. Uh, with Nancy Pelosi's iron fist. Steve, how many glasses of wine did you have to drink uh, as a result of Nancy Bottles. Pelosi's power? Bottles of wine, not glasses. <laughs> no, she, she will wear you down. Uh, you know, that is one of her talents. She will just stay in the ring with you for as long as she needs to. Um, Susan, if I may, uh, there's a, when you go into her office, there's a, a wonderful photograph of her father with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and you talked about her relationship with her father and her father as, you know, just a, an extraordinary power broker 
a street fighter, mayor of Baltimore, former congressman. But then there's a quote in the book that I'd like to share with you and get your perspective. You write, after she became the most powerful woman in the history of the country, she said her children had been more influential in shaping the leader that she became than even her formidable parents. Quote, I was really forged by my children Having five children in six years and understanding the difference in personalities from one to the next is a real lesson. Talk about the lessons that she derived from her children. Yes, and I, I know that parents who have school-age kids now during this past year of COVID will understand the skills you obtain by, by running a household. You know, she said that, uh, she said that being the mother in a house of five children required the same skills as being speaker of the house in Washington, in that you're trying to impose order in chaos. You're dealing with grievances real and imagined. Uh, you're trying to convince sometimes unreasonable people to stop doing what they're doing and do whatever it is you want to do. You have these shifting alliances. You know, with five kids, you can imagine. Sometimes it's, you know, four to two, and sometimes it's you're even up, and sometimes you're all in your own camp very much like, like, like Congress. Uh, this is an argument that, Steve, as you know, from your when you were recruiting candidates to run uh, for Congress when you were head of the uh, DCCC, this is an argument she would sometimes use with women who would, she wanted, you and she wanted to run, uh, consider runs for office who were saying they didn't have the right experience. They were, uh, you know, their experience was mostly in the home. And I believe, that you tell me if this is right, that she would tell them that same, story that the skills that you gain by being the mother running a household are not dissimilar from what you need to bring to Washington. Did you hear her make that argument? I heard her make that argument uh, many, many times. Uh, and it usually worked. It usually worked. Of course, uh, before I, I, I send it back over to Chris, there was a very famous quote that uh, Speaker Pelosi used in a White House meeting with President Trump uh, when uh, he uh, began yelling at her. Some, one of them is, please don't characterize the strength I bring to this meeting. But another one was more directed at uh, her own experience as a, a mom. Can you share that quote? Well, what, oh, yes. Of course, she said, I, I recognize a temper tantrum when I see one. Yes, she came back from a meeting with Trump and she shrugged off the fact that he had blown his top and said, I'm, I'm the mother of five. I recognize a temper tantrum when I see one. I can tell you that I don't know what Trump said when he heard her say that but I'm sure it wasn't good because, because uh, she did have an ability to get under his skin. There was that other famous exchange, actually the last time the two of them had a conversation in October of 2019, uh, meeting in the cabinet room that was purportedly about Syria, but became all about impeachment. It's the one where she's standing up and jabbing her finger at him uh, in this table that seems to be full of men, actually Liz Cheney, was also there, although you don't see in the picture. All the men are looking at their shoes, right? <laughs> General Milley, if you look at him, he seems to be praying. Nancy Pelosi is standing up and yelling at Trump, who's looking at her. When Nancy Pelosi leads a walkout uh, from the cabinet room, something that I've never heard of before, uh, uh, Trump says, you're a third-rate politician. And Steny Hoyer told me that if he had heard Trump say that, and apparently the remark was directed at st st saying to Steny Hoyer, Nancy Pelosi is a third rate politician. Steny Hoyer told me that he would have said, if Nancy Pelosi is a third rate politician, I'm a fifth rate politician and you're not a politician at all. You know, Susan, what I also like about the point that Steve just made about um, Nancy Pelosi's having learned from her children and getting prepared from her children is, is the circle, I mean, from the parents, the relationship and the effect that her parents had on her, um, you know, I would half expect uh, a possible subtitle of your book to be, Apples Don't Fall Far From <laughs> Could you take us back to 1950s Baltimore? Because you paint a picture, you bring this period and this, this time, um, the, the cars, the buses, the parochial schools, the Baltimore Orioles returning, and for Nancy Pelosi, I think it seems that that was where she learned the benefits of being operational. And I, I, I'd love to hear about Baltimore 1950s and as well, you know, Big Nancy and Tommy the Elder 
and the way that they used politics to operate, to get things done, to create benefits for constituents. Um, take us back to that part. So Tommy the Elder, definitely, uh, definitely a larger than life figure, kicked out of uh, kicked out of St. Leo's parochial school when he was 13 years old. Never went back to get any diploma of any kind. Uh, after he was a member of Congress, the nuns at St. Leo's invited him back to the courtyard and presented him with an honorary diploma, graduating from elementary school. Uh, but this big figure, New Deal politician, challenged a six-term Democratic incumbent in Congress when loyalty to FDR was one of the main differences between them. He was so enamored with FDR that he named his first son, Thomas, after himself. He named his second son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt D'Alessandro. Uh, so these were New Deal politicians. These were people who believed in an expansive government that was there to help people. And, uh, you know, a big city government. So in some ways, a corrupt government, I think the way uh, we might look at it today, a, a city government that that was known for, for patronage, for instance, there was uh, one political boss who wanted to place uh, a friend and aide in a city job. And Mayor D'Alessandro said, well, what can he do? And the political boss said, we can't really do much of anything. And, uh, and Mayor D'Alessandro said, oh, well, good, you know, basically we can have a blank slate there for the no-show job that he was trying to get for this age. So a different, a different time in that sort of politics, but the same, uh, Nancy Pelosi continues to reflect the New Deal agenda of her parents. She continues to believe in a big government, an expansive government, that especially at a time that like we have today in the wake of this terrible pandemic, it should be filling a big role in terms of providing a safety net for people. Susan, I'd like to talk about uh, her leadership race. Uh, and uh, you covered it just uh, with uh, just marvelously. Uh, one of the lessons that Nancy Pelosi learns from uh, the Jerry Brown primary for president uh, and from other races is you don't wait to get into uh, an election. You get in on your own terms, not anybody else's. She decides she's going to run for leader, uh, uh, leadership mm -hmm. position. No woman had ever been in a leadership position in the Democratic caucus in the House of Representatives. And she decides she's going to just kick the door open. Uh, can you talk about what that race was like uh, and her approach to that race in, in terms of timing and how she worked the caucus? And of course, not only had no woman been in a senior leadership position in the House Democratic Caucus, no woman had ever been in a senior leadership position in either chamber for either party. Um, so there was somebody waiting in line in that orderly way of the democratic establishment for the job of democratic whip whenever it came open. And that was Steny Hoyer, uh, who had been Nancy Pelosi's, who Nancy Pelosi had known since the days they were both working for Senator Brewster. Uh, she she uh, disputed the need to defer to the people who were waiting orderly in line and launched what amounted to be an insurgent campaign. This campaign went, this campaign for a Democratic whip, she announced before there was an opening for a Democratic whip. And the process of getting an opening took longer than she expected. This race lasted three years. It involved millions of dollars in money raised by Steny Hoyer and Nancy Pelosi as contributions to members of the House Democratic Caucus. It was brutal. It was a brutal fight that left some scars that remained for a long time afterwards. But it demonstrated, and you know, the fact that it's a secret ballot made it more complicated because somebody could tell you they were going to vote for you and then not do so. Nancy Pelosi de demonstrated in that race her ability to count votes, which has been one of the, her skills ever since. When the vote was, when the job finally came open, the vote was finally held just after 9 11. In fact, uh, she was the one who won. You know, there's been so much made about the supposed rivalry between Pelosi and Sawyer, you know, and, uh, you know, how, how detrimental it is. I've always viewed it as saying, well, there's a problem, you know, when you have Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. In the <laughs> I mean, that's, those are two pretty heavy hitters. I always thought it advantaged House Democrats. Chris? Susan just mentioned, um, and, and Steve, you brought us to that period. Um, you just mentioned 9-11, Susan. 
And you, you write a lot about uh, Nancy Pelosi's reaction uh, at 9-11 and then even more um, about the Iraq war and about Pelosi's um, relationship with George W. Bush uh, as we got into that war and then as things progressed. Um, we, we live now in a pretty toxic time of politics, um, but that was not a great relationship. And my reading of what you had to say is that it's maybe not all George Bush's fault. You maybe hold <laughs> Nancy Pelosi somewhat responsible as well. Was I reading that correctly? So Nancy Pelosi, uh, enormously skilled in negotiating this polarized time in our politics, but I think critics would say that she didn't do very much to make to change the kind of politics to make it to make it less toxic. Um, it's not that she created the situation in which we we find ourselves with our government often being dysfunctional. It's that she worked in the world in which she was given. She didn't try to transform it to to some other world. She and George W. Bush had a very difficult relationship. Nancy Pelosi was the highest ranking member of Congress to oppose the Iraq war from the start. Uh, that was, you know, I was actually thinking about that with the news today on Liz Cheney. Liz Cheney is taking a position now that is politically perilous uh, with her own party. Uh, the smart money in Republican sides is to side with Donald Trump, not with Liz Cheney. You know, that was also true with the with the Democratic Party at the beginning of the Iraq war. The Democrats who wanted to run for president had presidential ambitions almost to a person supported the war in its early days. That turned out to be something that was damaging to them. In any case, Nancy Pelosi, the highest ranking member of Congress to oppose the war from the start. And when she was first elected speaker, in large part because of the war, uh, because in the tw 2006 election, uh, Republicans had setbacks because of voter unhappiness over the war. She was convinced she was going to be able to persuade George W. Bush to change course in Iraq. She was unable to do that despite two years of all the efforts she could think of. And by the time of the 2008 financial meltdown, it had been months since they had talked, since the president and the speaker had had a conversation. Uh, they started talking again only because that financial crisis really forced bipartisan action to try to address it. Steve, could I ask you, we've had the opportunity, Steve, you and I, to talk about your vote in the, against the Iraq war. And as I was reading Susan's telling of that, and um, I have here what she, she got nearly two thirds of the Democratic caucus voting no, right, Susan, 126 to 81. One of those 126 was Steve Israel. And Steve, did Nancy Pelosi's argument hold any influence in, or, uh, let me ask you differently, how much influence did Nancy Pelosi's argument hold in your own decision to vote against the war? And, and what did you think of Susan's telling of that part of that story? Well, I, I thought uh, it was as if uh, Susan was with us on the floor of the House and in <laughs> when Nancy Pelosi expressed herself. But I, I, I would say this, and I'm going to be very brief because this is about Susan's book and we're going to open it up to questions. One of the real skills and talents of Nancy Pelosi was not only knowing her caucus, but knowing your district. And she knew that I represented a 9-11 district, that I had, uh, my district had lost 200 and over 200 uh, of my constituents. She also knew that I was one of the most um, endangered incumbents elected to a Republican seat in 2000, considered to be a one-termer. Uh, nobody thought, including myself, I'd get reelected. And I do remember speaking with her and her you know, going through uh, you know, many, of, many of the arguments uh, and her saying, look, we need to keep you here. Nancy Pelosi's brilliance is she knows how to count votes she also knows how to keep Democrats in Congress. Uh, and so she threads a needle. And uh, I believe she did that with that vote uh, and others. We're gonna open it up to uh, questions and answers in just about five minutes. Susan, I, I, I would ask you this. Um, throughout the book, you talk about this fixation with Nancy Pelosi's wardrobe. Uh, you know, the, and, and these unfair headlines, one comes to mind, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi, not just another party girl, you know, things like that. 
And uh, you know, this obsession with what she's wearing and, and how she dresses, which I've never heard directed at any male politician. I don't ever remember in my 16 years in Congress, somebody commenting on my shoes or my suit. Can you talk about her own attitude towards uh, those perceptions? You know, I think she didn't worry about them much. You know, she she had um, she was a subject of clearly sexist attacks in the only race she ever lost, which was when she ran for Democratic chair uh, after the 1984 debacle um, with Walter Mondale, who we lost so recently. May he rest in peace. Uh, you know, after that 49 state loss, she had been chair of the California Democratic Party and a success in it. She thought she was the best candidate to be national chair, and she probably was. Uh, but she was subjected to accusations like you're saying that she was a dilettante, that she was a party girl. The AFL-CIO political director called her an airhead. Now, Nancy Pelosi may be many things. An airhead she is not but she lost that race anyway. And she complained about it. She complained about it to reporters. She complained about the sexism of the attacks. And she never, so far as I could tell, ever made those complaints publicly again. I think she decided it was not useful to respond. And she, there was a phrase that she developed in the wake of that loss that she would use for the rest, she, she uses to this day. And that is, don't agonize, organize. So when people would come to her and say, I can't believe they're saying these things about you. And think of the thousands and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in attacks that have been waged on her by Republicans in the years since then. She doesn't usually respond. She says, don't agonize, organize. Let's uh, have Natalie give instructions for folks uh, who want to uh, ask questions. I want to remind everybody that uh, we are with Susan Page, the author of Madam Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power, including Don't Agonize, Don't Organize. <laughs> also, also, no one ever gives you power. You must take it. Uh, another uh, one of her, her maxims. Uh, this is sponsored by the Cornell University Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. Natalie, why don't we give folks uh, instructions on how to pose questions, please? Absolutely. Um, so if you have any questions for our speaker tonight, you can go ahead and write them at the Q&A at the bottom. We'll take written questions if you prefer to um, come on the program and ask your question live. You could also use the raise hand function that's at the bottom of the screen. We'll be taking questions both ways tonight. While it's queuing up, Chris, why don't you pose a question? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on, um, Susan, you were just talking about attacks on Nancy Pelosi. I wanted to ask you about this um, other politician, his name escapes me at the moment, but I think he spent four years attacking Nancy Pelosi very recently. And it's such a striking line um, from, from your book. So at this point, obviously with Donald Trump in office, um, Pelosi has, you know, she's been the highest ranking American woman in politics, you know, twice. She's got the Affordable Care Act. She did the bailout and, you know, so many things that had been accomplished. And yet you write it was her ability to stand up to President Donald Trump that finally meant Nancy D'Alessandro Pelosi would be underestimated no more. Was Donald Trump good for Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> and, you know, D Donald Trump had a big impact on Nancy Pelosi and on the arc of her life because um, not, not many people, I think, were aware of this, but she had been planning to retire after the 2016 election. She assumed like so many of us did that Hillary Clinton was gonna be elected, that she could count on Hillary Clinton to protect the Affordable Care Act, which was the achievement she was most proud of. Uh, she was 76 years old any place but Congress, that would be retiring age. Uh, but on that election night, um, she, when she realized a little earlier than the rest of us that Trump was going to win that election, she described it as, feeling like she was being kicked by a mule. Not, and she said that was not a metaphor, that she said physically like she was being kicked by a mule. She decided by the end of that night to, to stay on, to stay in power. Uh, she felt that Donald Trump posed a threat to things she cared about, like the Affordable Care Act, and also a threat to democracy itself. That was a concern that grew greater and greater and greater over time and really came, reached its apex uh, with the with the January 6th attack on on the Capitol, I think that that Trump's ascension um, kind of made Democrats and everyone else aware 
of some of the skills she had been displaying through her career in the legislature that not everyone had recognized. You know, she gives, one of the re- ways she keeps power is the way she gives credit. She's very careful to give credit to others. And she gave credit to Barack Obama for the Affordable Care Act, and that's true. Wouldn't have an Affordable Care Act without Barack Obama in the White House. But you know, we wouldn't have had an, an Affordable Care Act without Nancy Pelosi in Congress. And I think that her um, primacy, her skills, her ability to hold Democrats together and to play st- smart, long-term strategic politics against this, this disruptive president, I think that has really been the capstone of her career. Natalie, let's take uh, some questions. Sounds good. Um, so we actually have a former member that's joining us um, that has a question. Mark Kritz, um, if you could unmute, please, you can go ahead and ask a question. Former Democratic Congressman from Pennsylvania, Mark Kritz. Mark, it's good to have you on. Thanks, Steve. It's uh, it's good to be here. Uh, Susan, thank you so much for uh, uh, writing this book. But uh, my question is more, uh, I guess, historical in knowledge or in uh, in. Uh, uh, flavor is that uh, I happened to be at Nemecolon Woodlands uh, when uh, Jack Martha, when Nancy Pelosi gave her presentation uh, in Fayette County in southwestern Pennsylvania, and you referenced that in your book. Uh, and I'm just curious to, to hear more. Uh, unfortunately, my time there was so quick and I was quite, I was so busy. I never really got a chance to, to sit down with uh, the speaker and and talk about her relationship with uh, Jack Martha. And I'd be curious to, to hear from you what, uh, what she shared. Thank you. Con- Congressman, thanks so much. And thanks so much. I'm honored that you're, uh, that you're joining us tonight. Well, you know, she loved Jack Martha. And, you know, she's not a particularly um, openly emotional person. Um, she's pretty disciplined and kind of guarded. But I would, one way I tried to uh, cultivate, convince her to be more candid with me was I would bring her stuff that I discovered in doing research for her biography. And one of the things I found in the archives at the University of Pittsburgh were Jack Murtha's papers, uh, including some handwritten notes he had made about his thoughts on Nancy Pelosi. And these were notes that he made when he was going to write a memoir, which he never did. No, and he described... Forgive me for interrupting, but for those who don't know who Jack Murtha is, mm-hmm. uh, maybe you can just give a little bit of explanation. Right. The contrast between Murtha and Pelosi, forgive me. Yes, of course, of course you're right. Uh, although you've got such a smart elite audience, I'm sure they all know who Jack Murtha is. But Nancy Pelosi is a San Francisco liberal. Jack Murtha is a guy from coal country, a, a, a Marine, uh, a member of the old guard in Congress, and not exactly a natural ally of Nancy Pelosi, but the two of them became friends and allies. And one of the big assets she had when she sought a leadership position was that Jack Murtha agreed to run her leadership campaign. This was a huge shock to Steny Hoyer, by the way, who thought he had Jack Murtha. Uh, And in these, so so I'm looking in these papers for why Jack Murtha was willing to do this. Murtha in these handwritten notes said that a lot of the old guys were reluctant to have a woman as leader. I think that he would probably fit in that category as an old guy, but that she was as effective a leader as she as he had ever met. And I I made a copy of these. I mean, there, these this was on it like a tablet. This was not some fancy written out thing. This was written in red ink on a on a, a big chief tablet. <laughs> um, and I made a copy of them and took it to Speaker Pelosi in the next time I was interviewing her. And I, it was about as emotional as I ever saw her get, thinking about Jack Murtha, who is of course now passed away, and his thoughts about her. Thank you. Natalie, next question. Great, so we have a question written in from Tracy Metrano, who ran for Congress um, up in Ithaca. Uh, She writes, looking so closely at the speaker's life and experience as a woman in politics and observing politics generally, do you think that it will be any easier for women to operate in Congress? Has she paved a path or does every generation recreate the obstacles that tend to hold women back? Well, that's that's such a great question. And uh, again, honored to have uh, have uh, someone who had run for Congress 
listening to this conversation, I'd be curious about your view of this. But in my view, she's made a big difference. She's cut up. There's now been a woman who has served uh, in this position of great authority and done it more effectively than any other speaker in modern times. I think you would have to go back to Sam Rayburn to find a speaker who has been as effective as Nancy Pelosi has been in that office. And that has, that has to send a message to uh, women who want to seek positions of leadership, to young women who are maybe thinking about a career in politics, to little girls who are thinking about what can I do in my life? And they look up and they see Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been a Supreme Court justice and Nancy Pelosi has been Speaker of the House. Uh, so yes, I think, it, I think it does make a difference. Natalie? Um, so overwhelmingly, our questions coming in uh, to see if you have any insight on, on the speaker's future. Uh, she was looking to the Senate or President of Ron, if you could give us any insight there. So um, when in 2018, when Democrats won back the House, there was a uh, contested leadership fight. I mean, there was some interest among House Democrats to move to a new generation of leadership. And at that point, Nancy Pelosi made an offer that she would serve just two more terms, which would mean that this would be her last Congress as a member of the leadership. Now, interestingly, when I went back and look at this, this was never put into the democratic rules. It's not a law, you can't make her do it. Um, and she hasn't made a kind of Sherman-esque statement about what her plans are. But early this year, she did indicate, she acknowledged that she remembers making this uh, offer in 2018. And she indicated that she plans to live up to that. So that would make this her last term. Again, dangerous to predict anything uh, too clearly in politics, but my expectation is that this is these are her last two years as a leader and last two years as a member of Congress. Oh, and what she plans next. So I have a personal theory that is based not so much on reporting, uh, so take it for what it's worth, but I could see President Biden appointing her as ambassador to the Vatican or as ambassador to Italy, where her grandparents immigrated from as a kind of closing element of her career. And one reason I think of that is because her mentor uh, or one of her mentors was Lindy Boggs, the Congresswoman from Louisiana, who in, a, after she left Congress was appointed by President Clinton as ambassador to the Vatican. And Lindy Boggs's daughter, was one of her daughters was Cokie Roberts, uh, who was someone I interviewed for the book before Cokie sadly passed away. And Cokie said that she could see her mother would really like that if, uh, if Nancy Pelosi ended up following in her footsteps in that way. Thank you. We have a question from Rhonda asking if you could please speak on Pelosi's fundraising abilities. I know that that's been talked about quite a bit recently. Man, she is unparalleled as a fundraiser. The, her office announced a couple of weeks ago that she has now raised $1 billion since she was elected to the leadership, money for various democratic campaigns, a billion dollars. No one else has come close to that. Uh, fundraising has long been one of her, one of her strengths, uh, one of the things she brings to the table. Uh, it's, it's one of the, she's used it to reward people. She's used it to to cultivate support, she's used it to get Democrats elected and to get Democrats into the majority. It's really a, a phenomenal amount of money. Natalie, yep, uh, I'm just gonna call on somebody that's had their hand raised. Um, Michi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If you could go ahead and unmute, you can ask your question to Susan Page. Okay. Um, we will give Howard a try. Howard Sobel, if you could please unmute, you can go ahead and ask your question. Howard, you with us? All right, let's... Um, I'm with you, but I did not uh, uh, put forth a question, so uh, I'll yield my time to the <laughs> uh, 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 next person. <laughs> Thank you, Howard. Um, piggybacking off uh, a question that we had a bit earlier. Um, our audience is asking if you might be able to make a prediction about who is likely to succeed Nancy Pelosi um, now that Congressman Israel is with Cornell. Yeah. 
Well, of course, you don't have to be a member of Congress to be in the leadership, so he could still be a prospective speaker. Uh, but if you're thinking about the people who are most often mentioned as uh, potential successors, I think top of that list would be Hakeem Jeffries, a congressman from New York, now a member of the leadership. He would also be a groundbreaker, the first person of color to lead either house of uh, either party in both either house of, of Congress. Uh, there are some others too, Karen Bass, uh, the Congresswoman from California. She's a former Speaker of the California House. Uh, Adam Schiff has been interested in in the leadership as well. Um, so there are uh, several people who I think would like this job. In fact, there are probably two hundred people who would like this job. Uh, and I think that when Pelosi leaves, there will be a battle. There'll be a progressive candidate or more than one and a centrist candidate and a leadership candidate. Uh, so um, uh, that'll be a, a battle to watch. Nancy Pelosi will have a, a role in that, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know if she'll make an endorsement, but she'll have a voice that matters. But Nancy Pelosi understands that just as when she got into the leadership, the leadership did not determine her victory, that she will not be in a position to determine the victory of who succeeds her because it'll be up to the member, Democratic members of the House, and it's a secret ballot. Susan, can I uh, chime in on this? You know, and uh, you, you talk about the, the succession talks uh, and uh, how that played out with a, a number of my colleagues. In, in, in those conversations, when they came up, uh, she always said that she viewed the future and her successor as somebody with three qualities. Number one, uh, somebody who reflects core democratic values. Number two, somebody who can keep the caucus together, which is no small feat. And number three, somebody who can negotiate with a president uh, and a Senate leadership of either party. So to the extent, my view, to the extent that when and if she begins thinking about who replaces her and to the extent that she weighs in on that issue, I think those three criteria are going to be quite operative with her. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's right. And what I think how difficult it is to do those things, mm -hmm. right? To keep the Democratic caucus together. It's crucial since the margin is so narrow, uh, but it's no, it's no easy task. You know, her ability to keep centrists from revolting uh, when they have to go back to districts like your district, purple districts, and members of the squad from, from uh, defecting, that is really a considerable skill. And negotiating with presidents, you know, she is, uh, it's hard to negotiate with presidents. People melt when they walk into the Oval Office, uh, but she has dealt with a series of them uh, in part, I mean, in a way it goes back to her, her childhood. I have a picture of her in the book when she's 16 years old and talking to JFK so this is a person who has had a lot of dealings with presidents and is not phased by them. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. We have a hard stop at eight o'clock as we tape this. So 10 minutes left. Natalie, let's see how many questions we can get in. And Chris, if you have a question, I'd love for you to chime in as well. Thank you. I was going to, there's a question um, for Susan that I wanted to pick up on and, and ask the question from the chat. Susan, you just mentioned the squad and the question is, you know, how has Madam Speaker's relationship evolved with AOC? And to lead into that, you wrote on page 281, um, Nancy Pelosi saw something of herself in AOC, even when she, uh, AOC, was causing trouble, maybe especially that. <laughs> Could you talk about her relationship with AOC? Yeah, well, Nancy Pelosi isn't against disruption. I mean, Nancy Pelosi has been a disruptor, right? And she's not against passion for your political views because she has a lot of passion for her political views. She said that uh, that she she when she was thinking about AOC, talking about AOC, she said, you know, I used to march and protest, and I used to rail against the politicians who would settle for half a loaf. Um, but her perspective now is a little different because while she's disruptive and passionate, she's also operational, her highest praise. And being operational means you can have a strong view, you should have a strong view, but you're willing to do the things that are required to actually make it happen, to actually get something done. And one of the best interviews I had with her came on a few hours after she had had a big blow up with the squad in the Democratic caucus, the squad, the four members of the squad had 
had defected on an immigration vote that Nancy Pelosi had really wanted Democrats to hold together on. And it set off this cascading effect of rather public criticism between the squad, between the person who was in AOC's chief of staff and between other Democrats in Congress. And she said that, uh, that some people didn't understand the difference between making a fine pate and making sausage. And that while it's very nice to make a fine pate, most of the time you're making sausage. Uh, in Washington. And she also quoted Dave Obey, who was the former chair of the Appropriations Committee of Wisconsin, Paul. And Obey had the saying that some people come to Washington to pose for holy pictures to show how perfect they are. And other people come to Washington to actually legislate. And Nancy Pelosi would definitely put herself in the corner with those who actually wanted to legislate. And her complaint with the squad, I think, is that they do not seem to always understand the process that's involved in doing that. Natalie, before we go to the next question, I want to remind people to, to purchase this <laughs> book. Uh, go to www.12books.com uh, and follow the links uh, to Matt and Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power. Uh, it's the best reading you can get. Let's go to the next question, Natalie. Great. So we had a question from former Congressman Martin Frost. If you could add and unmute, you can ask your question. This is um, an anecdote that I think Susan would be interested in. Can you hear me okay? Martin. And um, Steve may recall this. Uh, when, the, uh, we were, when the Democrats were trying to run, win the House back in 2006 and were in the middle of a heated battle, uh, my wife died and Nancy called me to express her sympathy and then asked when the funeral would be. And I, I told her, and this was in September of 2006 when the issue was still in doubt as to whether we would win the house. She came to the funeral, went to graveside and then attended the reception afterwards. After that, I would do anything for Nancy. <laughs> yeah. And Susan, that, that occurs throughout your book. I mean, that personal <laughs> touch, the sending orchids uh, to mm -hmm. people that, uh, the, the favor list, that just ironclad gr grasp of everybody who is important to her, and even some who aren't that important to her, right? Steve, if I could yeah. follow up on one thing. Um, in, uh, after, the, after the, we lost the House in 2010, the New York Times wrote an editorial saying she should not uh, continue as Democratic leader. She asked me to respond to the Times, which I did, and I wrote a very, and they printed my response as to why she should remain as, as leader. And I was very happy to do that. And uh, it was an unusual relationship that we had. Steve, well, Cong Congressman Frost, it's so great to hear to hear from you and to hear that story and um, and the kind of bond that that forges to have had an experience like that. And there were I, I did hear several stories from people who had similar experience. I mean, there's the Gucci glove. I don't mean it's not sincere on Nancy Pelosi's part, but it's, it's very, it's, it's very meaningful uh, to people to have an experience like that. When I interviewed Bob Dole for this book, uh, and Bob Dole, no friend of Nancy Pelosi politically, right? He was very excited because his birthday was coming up and Nancy Pelosi always sent him an orchid on his birthday, which meant a lot to him. And that's what he talked about in this interview that this he was sure this orchid would arrive. Uh, in a couple of days. Uh, and I actually checked back with her office since I was putting that anecdote in the book to make sure she in fact sent him an orchid and, he, and, and they had. Natalie, let's take the next question. I think we have time for maybe two, possibly three. Great. Um, so we had a couple questions in the chat asking if you could speak to um, the tearing up of the State of the Union speech <laughs> if this sees the pass forward for bipartisanship. So, you know, I've been in Washington a long time. I had never seen anything like that, like that close to the State of the Union speech last year in 2020. And I asked her about it in, when I was interviewing her about how the tearing up of the text came about. She said that uh, President Trump arrives, hands her the text uh, as is customary for the president to give the speaker a text of the address that he or she is about to deliver. Um, and that she's leafing through it, reading it quickly because she wants to see what he's gonna say. And she sees something that she thinks is inaccurate, is untrue. And she wants to make a little mark with a pen there so she can find it. 
And so she can't find a pen. I guess even if you're Speaker of the House, you don't carry your purse up with you to the dais. There's a little desk in front of her. She opens, uh, and she opens up the drawer. Uh, there's nothing in the drawer. There's no pen. So she, since she doesn't have a pen, she makes a tiny, tiny tear in the margin of the speech text so that she can find this thing that she thinks is untrue. And then she sees something, she keeps reading, she sees something else she thinks is untrue and makes another tiny tear and another thing she thinks is untrue and makes another tiny tear. And by the time it's at the end of the speech, there are little tears all the way up and down uh, the speech text. After she tore up the speech, some photographers went back to look at the pictures and saw her making these little tears. And there was some speculation that she had been planning to tear up the speech all along. She told me that wasn't true, that she hadn't decided what to do. Then the president awards the presidential medal to Rush Limbaugh, who was seated up in the first lady's box. That strikes her as an appropriate thing to do during a State of the Union address, uh, and especially to Rush Limbaugh, who is such a toxic figure for, for Democrats. So the speech ends, she stands up, she decides, she said, I decided if he was gonna shred the truth, I was gonna shred his speech. The speech was too thick for her to tear it in half. She divided it into four page, you know, four sets of pages, tore each of them in half in turn, tossed them on the desk. Meanwhile, my favorite part of this picture is Mike Pence, who is standing next to her, pretending he cannot see what she is doing. <laughs> All right, Natalie, let's take one final question. Great. Um, so we have a question from Ellen asking if you could please um, either compare or contrast the Speaker Pelosi and Newt Gingrich and the polarity of the House, and if you believe that Speaker Pelosi's great strength as a unifier of her own party in effect polarizes the Republicans even more. Well, she definitely, uh, she's definitely comfortable living in a polarized world, as was Newt Gingrich. Uh, Newt Gingrich, of course, um, uh, followed strategies that made our politics mo more polarized. Nancy Pelosi is very critical of Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich is very critical of Nancy Pelosi. But when I, I have to tell you, when I interviewed Newt Gingrich for the book, uh, he was criticizing her on policy um, as a hard liberal. But then he started to talk about how much respect he had for her as a politician, as someone who knew how to get and use power for the purposes she had. And he said that when he looked at Nancy Pelosi, he saw a fellow pirate. And if you're Newt Gingrich, I think the words fellow pirate are intended as high praise indeed. Folks, over the next several weeks and months, Congress is going to be dealing with an infrastructure bill uh, with continued responses to COVID. Uh, with uh, campaign finance reform, with uh, many significant challenges. If you want to understand how Nancy Pelosi develops strategy and tactics and operationalizes it, uh, you should read Madam Speaker and Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. and the of Power. That will give you the best inside view of her during uh, these uh, very critical times. Susan Page, what a delight to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, May 12th at seven, Education and Politics with Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, the chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee. And May 19th, Governor Bill Richardson talking about how to navigate international hostage situations. You can receive more information by going, by Googling Cornell Institute of Politics. And I do recommend that you go to www.12books.com uh, and follow the links uh, to uh, Madam Speaker. Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power. Susan Page, Chris Rebeck, thank you all very much again. Bye everybody. <laughs>